an article that I want to read from, written by Mark Galley from uh, Baker Publication 2006, entitled Jesus Mean and Wild. He wrote, a group of Laotian refugees who had been attending the church I pastored in Sacramento, California, approached me after the service one Sunday and asked to become members. Our church had sponsored the newcomers and they had been attending the church only a few months. They had only a rudimentary understanding of the Christian faith. So I suggested we study the Gospel of Mark together for a few weeks to make sure that they knew what a commitment to Christ and His church involved. They happily agreed. Despite the Laotians' lack of Christian knowledge, or maybe because of it, the Bible studies were some of the most interesting I've ever had. After reading the passage in which Jesus calms the storm, I asked about the storms in their lives. There was a puzzled look among my Laotian friends, so I explained that we all have storms, problems, worries, troubles, crises. And this story teaches that Jesus can give us peace in the midst of those storms. So what are your storms? I asked. Again, more puzzled silence. And finally, one of them asked, Do you mean that Jesus actually calmed the wind and the sea in the middle of the storm? I didn't want to get distracted with the problems of miracles, so I replied, We should not get hung up on the details of the miracle. We should remember that Jesus can calm the storms in our lives. And another stretch of awkward silence ensued until someone said, Well, if Jesus calmed the wind and the waves, He must be a powerful man. At this, they all nodded vigorously and chatted excitedly to one another in Leo. Except for me, the room was full of wonder. And I suddenly realized that they grasped the story better than I did. God is very powerful. And Jesus is fully God and fully man. Well, our study here, we're going to start a new study, a four-week study on the book of Jonah. We're going to the Old Testament. We've been in the New Testament for almost two years now, so we are going back to the Old Testament. Jonah, the first chapter of Jonah is what we're looking at today. And to give you a little background, according to 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, Jonah lived during the time of Jeroboam II which is about 793 to 753 B.C. And that text reads, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned forty-one years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first king of northern Israel, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lamohabath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai the prophet who was from gath Hepher. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was no one to help Israel. But the Lord had said that He would not blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so He saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So here's what's happening here. Israel was in rebellion against God. Israel never had a good king. They were around for 210 years and every one of their kings were evil and did what was not right in the eyes of the Lord. 
Jeroboam the first was the first king. Jeroboam the second is about ten or so kings behind him. Anyways, Israel was in rebellion against God. It was not following God's word. And in 722 B.C., the final deportation of Israel happened by the Assyrian Empire, their exile. This was only about 30 to 40 years after Jeroboam II died during Jonah's time. So they were at the end, towards the end of their... They only had one more generation during the time of Jonah. The northern kingdom was in rebellion against God. Jonah's name, and there was two kingdoms of Israel. You had the southern and the northern. The northern kingdom had ten tribes. The southern had two. Jonah's name, Jonah, means the dove, to be gentle, or to destroy. The son of Amittai means to be true, firm faithfulness. And from Geth Hefer means the winepress of the well. So let's start off on this, which is what we basically are going to see here is that his name is in complete irony to what he really is. But the wine press, the one part that's here, there's a, there's a balance that's here, good or bad, and in the middle of it is truth. But you see that the wine press, wine is singing and joy, but the wine press is usually wrath, blood, trampling on the wrath of God. The well, though, is a life-giving refreshment, especially to desert regions. It's a symbol of salvation. And also, the well is a place of divine marriage, especially for the children of God. Gath-hefer is a few miles north of Nazareth, also where Jesus grew up. And Jesus speaks of Jonah in Matthew 12, 38 through 42, which we'll come back to later in today's sermon. For centuries, the book of Jonah had been read on the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, the most solemn fast day in the Jewish liturgical calendar. It's the day of reconciliation. Once a year that they come before God and all of their sins are forgiven. Very holy day. A day of reconciliation. And every, on the second, or on the afternoon service, this message of Jonah was read. It's important to God's people. It's a message of repentance and forgiveness, the salvation of God, but even more importantly, it reveals something about God's identity, His name, and therefore who His people are as well. And that's why our series is called In the Name of God. So we're going to look at three sections uh, three sections of chapter 1 here today which expose the name of God and His salvation. And that is why it's entitled the Salvation, salvation for the Mariners. So our first section is Jonah runs from Yahweh's call. Yahweh is the name of God that was revealed to Moses. And it means life-giving, full of life. Life emanates out of he who lives so here's what it says. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So the word of the Lord, this phrase is mentioned seven times in this book. It's a symbol of creation, of revelation, and identity. God had already chose Jonah to bring a message of salvation and grace to the rebellious Israel. That's what you saw in the second Kings passage, is they didn't deserve it. In fact, they didn't have a Savior. And God had already turned His back somewhat on them. But He wasn't ready to totally send their, them over to exile. So He gave them some salvation through this evil king, even. And it was by the mouth of Jonah. So God gave them grace already through the mouth of Jonah. And now he was gonna, God is calling Jonah to go to Nineveh and deliver a warning in regards to their evils. Nineveh was a very old and significant city used as an alternative royal residence for the Assyrian kings. And the word that's used great here, I'm going to leave that 
mysterious yet for us. We don't know what it means by great yet. But these were Nazi stormtroopers of the ancient world. They were as evil as it gets. And they were definitely enemies that were knocking on the door of Israel. They were horrible and horrifying and they loved intimidation and brutal um, massacring of people to terrify others into surrendering to them. So Jonah, but Jonah rose not to go. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down to it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. See how there's an envelope there? Away from the presence of the Lord, three times mentions Tarshish. It's a testimony against Jonah and his fleeing. Tarshish means breaking or to shatter. It also means poverty. It's an unknown place, often taken as the ends of the earth, the unknown world. Some people have referred to it as Spain, but regardless, that's more of a um, speculation. God commanded Jonah to rise to go to Nineveh, but Jonah rose to flee and go to the ends of the earth, away from God's presence. Jonah believed that it would be better to run from God than to deliver a message of warning to the greatest evil nation known that he knew of, to submit to it, to God. Jews still today, some, some of them interpret the book of Jonah as them being a self-sacrificing nation for the betterment of the world. I would say that is exactly wrong. That is not the right interpretation of this passage at all. It doesn't fit. Jonah would rather live apart from God's presence than to obey Him. Joppa means beautiful or the better option, more attractive. He paid the fare and went down into the ship, in the heart of the ship, to cross the seas and escape from God. Total betrayal. In Acts 10, Joppa is where? Didn't we just have a sermon on the book of Acts? In Acts 10, we spent over a year on that. In Acts 10, Joppa is where Peter was when Cornelius sent for him. And Cornelius, Cornelius was instructed by an angel as well as Peter um, to open the gates of salvation to the Gentiles. It's the longest section in the book of Acts. It's by far the most important also in the book of Acts. It's the time Peter had the keys to the kingdom of God and it's where Peter opened up the gates to all of the world, the salvation of God. And he was in Joppa when that happened. And that is exactly so Peter was obedient because God called him to do something that was against, even it seemed to be against the very word of God himself, of mixing with the nations, right? But we see Jonah is doing the opposite. Jonah ran from God. Peter went when it didn't make sense. And Jonah ran when it didn't make sense. But these are purposely put together. Where have you rejected God's will or call upon you? Do you hear God's voice in your life? And do you follow it? If you don't hear His voice, then I would highly recommend please talk to someone who can help you to find out how to hear that. Because that is essential for the children of God our Father speaks to us regularly. And you're not crazy to hear His voice. That's normal. And when He calls you, He will stretch you. He stretches all of us. Do you follow Him? Or do you rebel against? And if you have rebelled, the thing that's so beautiful about the salvation of God is that He gives the ability to always change that action. You can be more like Peter, obedient, and be forgiven for your disobedience with God. 
Will you change? If that is you from the past, don't live in the past and say, I could never be forgiven for what God has done or what I have done. That's Satan lying to you. There's always forgiveness with God as long as you are still on this earth. So that is the first section. The second section, Yahweh sends a storm. Jonah 1, 4 through 6. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner parts of the ship, and he had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. Perhaps the, gods, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may, may not perish. So the sea is an image in the Bible, throughout the whole Bible. You see, it's a central to the biblical picture of the universe. Israel believed that God used a cosmic sea to create a three-tiered universe. And that comes out of Egypt's mythology as well. You had the sea, the heavens, and the earth. And the cosmic sea also symbolizes the continued threat of the forces of chaos against God and His creation. The boundaries that He has set up for the sea, that they are not to pass, the waves crash against the boundaries. The ship is an element of mystery and insecurity. Israel was somewhat like cats in a way that they hated They didn't mind the lakes, wells, the rivers, and stuff like that, fresh water, but the big sea, they did not like the big sea. A ship, you see often as a place of insecurity, not secure, being tossed by the waves to and fro. But you also see that Noah was used, the ship was used also as a form of salvation to get through the chaos and the evil and the crashing of the waves against God's creation. It also is a way of big financial gain, a false hope, a worldly hope. So Jonah went down into this ship, into the heart of it. But the Lord hurled down a great wind upon the sea. So do you see here, whenever we got contrasts of two, there's a war that is going on. And that's what you see here. Because Jonah will not go to the great city, but runs the other way, the Lord brings a great wind. The same word for spirit and breath. A mighty tempest also. The word is great. It's the same word in Hebrew for all three. So he sends a great wind, a great tempest and storm. It's all linked Because Jonah wouldn't go to the great city. He has these great things hurled down on him. And they're all tied together. Even the vehicle that Jonah is using to reach Tarshish, which means breaking, is about to break. In the storm. Mariners who are seamen, they're sailors, they are also Gentiles. They feared God, it must have been very intense, even horrifying for people that are, this is their profession and they are horrified at what's happening. The fear is what opens them to seeking God's mercy. And they each cried out to their gods, which are not gods at all. They hurled cargo overboard. Don't you remember this also from the book of Acts in Paul's encounter in the storm? They hurled cargo overboard as God hurled a storm down on them. They rightfully attributed this event to an unhappy God. But Jonah went down into the inner parts of the ship and fell asleep. He fell asleep. They're terrified for their lives and he's asleep 
in the heart of the ship that sails on the chaos. He's trying to ride out the storm and ignore the fact that he is the reason for everyone else being put in danger. We often rationalize our own sins and try to ignore the repercussions. We deceive ourselves better than anyone else often. Everybody else is doing it. I'm just doing what everybody else does. That's not okay. The captain finds Jonah probably while he is emptying the ship in a panic. What are you doing down here? Don't you understand? Don't you see what's happening? Are you blind? And the answer to that is yes. Arise. Remember, God called to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. And this captain calls to him, arise and call out to your God. Perhaps He will have mercy on us and let us live. God uses the captain to call Jonah to repent, to turn back. He has mercy that he's dangling out in front of him. Non-Israelites are very submissive to God's work and His presence. They feared Him. But the one Israelite, there's only one Israelite in this whole story. He's the only one that is rebellious against God. The one Israelite in this story is hiding deep in the ship. He doesn't fear God. We had a a Bible study not too long ago called The Fear of the Lord. And Jim Baker was highlighted. Jim and Tammy Baker. Everybody knows of them. Associated with the Assemblies of God. He was a televangelist. Very popular. And he was involved in a sex scandal and then an accounting fraud which led to his divorce and imprisonment. John Bevere, the writer of This Fear of the Lord said that Jim had told him in an interview that he had always loved Jesus. Because John had asked him, when did you stop loving Jesus? He said, I always loved Jesus. I always loved Him. He goes, my problem was is I didn't fear Him. I didn't fear Him. And he said, the best thing that ever happened to me was when I went to prison. He said, this has been a blessing. I am humbled and in awe of God's incredible mercy because I was blind in the financial gain and everything else that was happening I was still lost and even though I loved Jesus I was not going to heaven and he's right he's right because if we don't fear God we don't follow him Jesus is just my buddy he's somebody I can fold up and put in my pocket. I can make him whatever I want to make him. And Jesus says, that's not okay. You follow me. Now don't get me wrong. If we are in a very dark place, you don't have to be perfect to be saved by Jesus. But you do have to take a step. And he keeps asking us to take a step with me. When I call, you follow me. When I say that this is where you need to go, go there. I know what you can handle. I know what you can't handle. And pray to me because I'll even meet you there and help you through that. But if we're running from him like Jonah was running, we are lost. And the horrifying thing of this is this is a message to God's people. This is not a message to the Gentiles. This is a message to the Israelites because Jonah represents Israel. Has the Lord got your attention? I hate it when we have to learn things the hard way. That's a practice, unfortunately, that seemed to be my only way of learning for a long time. I hate learning that way. Yet at the same point, sometimes that's the only way we listen. And until we get to the point where finally we say, you know what, God, I I don't want to learn the hard way anymore. Um, I'm kind of beat up right now. And why he says is not to be a beating up kind of God or an evil God or anything. It's because he loves us. 
And he says, well, then stop running from me and start following me. Because if you did love me, you would trust me that my ways are going to lead you into life. Why do you not trust me when I tell you to do something? Do it. Follow me. Isn't that the message that Jesus says? Follow me. Follow me. We follow the government, right? Most of the time. I hope. We follow the police. There are things that we fear, right? That if we don't, we're going to get put away or we're going to get thrown out of the country if we don't abide by the rules. Point being, God has rules also. And they are for our own good. And they are rules that get us into the kingdom of God. It's not earning anything. Jesus gets us in. But surrender is what he requires from us. And that's what faith is, is surrender. All right. Third section and the biggest of them all. Jonah is thrown into the sea. And they said to one another, this is the mariners, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And what people are you? Of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. So Jonah is exposed as being the guilty one. They know that. God has helped them with that. The mariners start to question him as to why all of this evil has come upon them because of him. What are the details? What's going on here? And Jonah opens his mouth and exposes his arrogance and his blindness more than anything. It's pretty obvious that he's not what he says he is, isn't it? His words and actions don't match up. He is a Hebrew, but he clearly doesn't fear the Lord who made the sea, which is furious right now, and the dry land and all the earth. So the men, then the men were exceedingly afraid. The word is great. They had great fear. And said to him, what is, what is that, what is this that you have done? What have you done? For the, man knew, the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. So the mariners are the wise ones here. It doesn't take a genius to see what's going on. Mariners are the wise ones. What have you done, you fool? You're trying to outrun God? He even told them that that's what he was doing. The things are getting worse and something needs to be done. If you know the Lord, who is the creator of the sea, then tell us how to appease him, is what they are begging. Tell us how to correct this situation that you have messed up. Jonah knows not only that it's his fault, but he also knows what needs to be done to correct the issue. He could have thrown himself into the sea. But he makes them have to do it. You could hurl me into the sea. 
Jonah, why don't you throw yourself into the sea if you're so righteous and such a great person of God? You could hurl me into the sea as you hurled your cargo overboard. I'm not convinced that Jonah really wants them to do that. In fact, I don't even think he thinks that they will do it, but he knows that it is the right choice. It is the truth. But he puts it into their hands. And we know this by what happens next. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. The word means great. There was a great fear of the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The mariners tried to do all that they could to get to dry land and not throw him in. Jonah knew that that's not what they wanted to do. That's why he made them have to throw him in. They tried, but it got worse. The storm would not let them get to land. And they pray to Yahweh by His name. They call out the name of Yahweh by His name. Do you see what's happening here? God will use His people to glorify Himself. We have to choose whether we're going to go kicking and screaming or willingly. When I was in Hawaii, I'm going to share a story that was on my honeymoon. I don't go to Hawaii normally, so to, that's not... I mean, any of you that are like, wow, pastor gets paid well. I need to be a pastor. No, that's not... It was a honeymoon. Um, bottom line is, went to a church out there, and there was a story that the pastor um, had shared that I'm going to share with you. He said that his daughter, a uh, beautiful daughter, was, woke up one morning, and she normally is this joyful, happy child and loved school. And one morning she woke up, and she was just not very happy. And she's sitting on the edge of her bed, and her father said, all right, it's time to go to school. And she sits there, and she goes, I'm not going to school today. And he goes, all right, we're going to get ready for school. We got to catch a bus and, and let's get going. Come on, let's get up. I'm not going to school today. He goes, okay, let me put it this way. We can either go with tickles and giggles or crying and screaming. But either way, you're going to school today. He goes, I'll give you five minutes to think about it and I'll come back and ask you how we're going to go forward. Tickles and giggles or crying and screaming. And she comes, he comes back and he says, so what did we decide? And she goes, I guess tickles and giggles. <laughs> That's what we're up against when we become God's children. We come into covenant with Him. And what we say is that we, the reason why we come into covenant, a marriage with Him, is that we say, I surrender my whole life to you. You now play God and King over me in every way. I don't want that role anymore. The covenant is, is I will follow you. That's our part of the deal. I will follow you. I will trust you. So when he says, and what happens is that he heals us so that we can join him in the reconciliation of humanity. He will glorify himself through his people. And whether that has happened through blessings and obedience on us, or whether it be disobedience and the wrath of God falls on us, Either way, he will be glorified to the rest of the world through his people. 
That's important. That's usually avoided because it's not a very popular thing people want to hear about. But unfortunately, that's essential for us to understand if we want to be saved. Because what's sad is I see people that come to me and they say, well, if God's so good, why have all this stuff happening to me? What I want to say is, is because you don't understand the salvation of God. You've been taught a lie in the gospel. You've been lied to. You've had someone that has taught you a gospel. It's not truth. It's something that meets you and feeds you what you want to hear. You want pleasant things. You want people to pat you on the back. You want people to say to you, peace. And peace, joy, like they did in the Old Testament, the prophets, when God says the whole point of them being there is to call people out when their sin is there so that they have the chance to come back to me. So when the prophet and priest have a bigger priority of pleasing God's people and being buddy-buddy with them all, they end up killing everyone. And God says, I will hold you accountable because I gave you that responsibility and you abused it. They didn't fear God. Their loyalty was to being popular. And they killed everyone. The prophet and priest are not always going to be everybody's favorite person. I always hope that people will appreciate at least the courage of a prophet or priest that loves them so much that they have the courage to call things out if it need be. They also still have to answer to God regardless. So how they do it is also something that they better be very careful about as well. Jonah is part of a nation that has given a wrong message and he does not fear God. And he is exposed big time, in this text. They hurled Jonah into the sea, and it stopped. The fury stopped. That's probably the face of the mariners. Just like those people in the Bible study. If Jesus can calm the wind and the sea of a storm, He's a very powerful man. Only God can calm the seas. Only God. God created it out of the seas according to the wisdom or literature as far as of creation. Jonah was to go to the great city, but he fled from God. So God, the Lord hurled a great storm and wind on the sea. But Jonah was blind, to the, but the Gentiles who rode, who rode in the sea, who traveled in ships, feared God greatly. Their great fear sought His mercy and He revealed Himself to them in love. The great storm was calmed and the great fear then was even more of who God is and He was glorified. They offered sacrifices and vows. What that means is they submitted to Him And they pledged their allegiance to Him. They were eternally saved. They became believers. They became worshipers of Yahweh. They made sacrifices to Him and vows, I commit my life to you. That's what they did. These Gentiles. Jonah should have been a light to them and he could have done it through blessings. But instead... God glorifies Himself through His wrath upon him. So when the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So a great fish also swallows up Jonah, all because he would not go to the great city, Nineveh. Three days and three nights is the amount of time that Jesus was in the tomb from Matthew 12, 40. My question to you comes back to that story I told you. Tickles and giggles, screaming and crying. What do you want to do? 
That's a very serious thing when we come in and say, I, I believe in you, Jesus. It's not just because we do it because everybody else is doing it. It is incredible blessings that come with it. Eternal life is no doubt amazing, but it starts now. And we're going to do, after the book of Jonah, I'm going to come back and do um, a, a sermon on Leviticus 26, which is the blessings and curses uh, from the law. And the reason why is because I want to talk, sit on that for a second. I want us to understand that. There's amazing blessings with God. But He also has the curses that come upon us. If we decide to go against Him, it never is to destroy them. He doesn't want to. But we do it to ourselves when we do that. And what He basically said, the prophets and the priests are supposed to teach His people, this is how you stop that. It's how you come out of it. Follow the Lord and it will release. He will heal you. He is a God of life and love and and. His name that's proclaimed to Moses in the book of Exodus is filled with mercy and loving kindness and steadfast love. And there's one thing at the end, but all of the guilty will absolutely be brought to justice. I will not let one person that deserves it be unjudged. But I am a God of mercy and forgiveness and steadfast love. awesome. I will show you the way back to me. Take it. Take it. It's your choice. You can run. Try to outrun God. Outrun God. And see what happens. Think of Jonah. The next section, next week, is going to address the horrifying reality that Jonah was kept alive in a big fish when he should have been dead. How horrible would that be to live in the fish guts and inside and innards of a fish, huge fish, dark, nasty. Three days. I'm sure he was in there going, it's not like the cartoons, like Veggie Tales, where he's floating on some piece of wood with a little fire in there and singing songs and stuff. Been horrified. Just let me die, God. But he kept him alive for three days and three nights. And something happens in Jonah in that time. We're going to look at that next week. But to wrap up today, there's three points that I want to make as we wrap it up. Number one, God rules. The Lord rules. He always has and He always will. The Lord rules. He always has. And He always will. No matter what it looks like to us. All creation is at His disposal and so far the wind, the sea, the huge fish all listen to Him. He sent them all and they all listen to His command. Isn't it ironic that the only one that's not listening to Him is His human child, an Israelite. Even the mariners are listening to Him. If we bring that into a contemporary, it would be like everyone except for Christians are listening to God and following Him. It would basically be the same thing. It's an honor to know the Lord and to serve Him. He's given us another chance. We should honor that. He expects us to trust His ways and His instructions even if we don't understand them. He is good and He is trustworthy. Second one is that God has mercy on all who humbly seek and surrender to Him. He is good and He is trustworthy. But His wrath remains on the rebellious. I put here even His children. I would even say especially His children. He's not okay with us rebelling. It's not because he, he's mad at us. The point is, is that He loves us. He chases us down because He says, don't you understand that you're killing yourself? Don't you understand what you're doing? Turn and come back to Me. And if His priests and prophets were doing their job, then we would know what that pathway is. And it would always be left open. We wouldn't feel that the church doors are shut on us. Or that we don't know about His grace 
and His mercy and His salvation. The third is that it is foolishness to think that we can outrun the Lord. I mean, come on. Seriously? Seriously. Jonah is going to outrun God. He's supposed to know God better than anyone, right? God even speaks to him. I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. And you, you can just see the mariners looking at him going, the heck you do. You're running from him. What is all this? If you fear him, what are you doing? You put us all in jeopardy here. If you know him, then why aren't you listening to him? Why are you running from him? Jonah exposes this in a couple of weeks for us. We'll find out. He, we find out the more that Jonah talks and speaks, the more he puts his foot in his mouth. And we actually see what his heart really looks like. The video that we had at the beginning. His heart, we find out, is far from God. God and Jonah are very different, but they're supposed to be identical. God's children are supposed to be like him, and Jonah is far from God. His work around us is supposed to transform us internally so that we look more and more like him and less and less like ourselves. Do we allow for God to transform us? To bring us to that place where we start to look more and more like Him. Because if we really know Him in truth, we will be in awe of Him. And we can't help but follow Him. Everything else is foolishness. But when we don't know Him, we're not afraid to run from Him. We need more work. We need Him to do more in us. And I'll say this. I wish I could say... Be more like me. And just listen to him all the time. But that's not my story. My story is, is I not only needed a beating, I needed a lot of them. And then once I was down, many more. And then after I thought I was done, I still brought more beatings on myself. Until finally, it's like those cartoons where you got this broken little white flag that kind of comes out of this smoking heap of ashes and, and went eyeballs or whatever and just kind of... <laughs> finally got the point. The question is, have you got the point yet or not? Because He wants to give us His blessings. And we get to do ministry and bring salvation to this world. But if we're still in rebellion against God, He'll use us. But it ain't going to be a fun journey at all. It'll be very painful for us. Very painful for us. May we be a church that does follow God and live in His blessings. That's what we were meant to be. Amen? Let's pray.